Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for September the 18th, 2020. This is episode number 24. Today, we'll be talking about what we expect to see on Tesla Battery Day, Hindenburg burst Nikola Motors stock bubble, and Ford announces its electric F-150 factory. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, multiple EV owner and Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from the Out of Spec and One Lap YouTube channels. Uh, he also puts together the super awesome videos for the new Inside EVs YouTube channel, including the one that just went live this morning uh, with an overland style Model Y powering through mud and water and up steep hills. Uh, you're not going to want to miss this or other videos we do. So go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. So welcome, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. Uh, let's start off with uh, talking about what we have charging up in our garages. And I believe Kyle's the only one with something new this week. And it's something pretty interesting. Do you want to give us a heads up on what that is? Yeah, absolutely. It is super interesting. So actually, the Nissan Leaf just went back. That's not the interesting part. I do want to touch on that car because I, I had it for a little over two weeks, almost three weeks. Uh, and this is the Nissan Leaf E plus 62 kilowatt hour big battery pack. Uh, I recently was able to do a charging session at my local Electrify America station where a couple interesting things happened. I let the Leaf cool down for almost two days in my driveway, not driving it. Drove it the you know five ten miles over to the station and uh, plugged in at zero percent cold battery and I instantly got seventy kilowatt on the Chatamo connector which it's only supposed to do fifty now uh, if it's a hundred kilowatt Chatamo the Leaf Plus can accept up to I think a hundred and four kilowatt peak on Chatamo is what I've seen in charging curves this did not go that high but it definitely was more than the 50 kilowatt of the plug uh, anyway that was super interesting sorry about the dog toy noise behind me and uh, <laughs> um, the battery pack went all the way up to the red during one charging session and then on my drive home I did a hard acceleration onto the highway and it overheated the battery so that was just absolutely awful uh shows you why liquid thermal management is so needed on evs the next thing that uh Dom already mentioned was the zero srs that is in my garage charging it is the most insane bonkers thing i've ever driven or ridden it's been a couple years since i've been on a motorcycle um but i got on this thing cracked the throttle and it's like instantly up to 120 plus miles an hour. Just an insano death machine. It's incredible. I absolutely love it. Um, and it's a, a lot of people in our audience would have experienced a, you know, Tesla ludicrous acceleration or something like this. And it's a very memorable moment. Um, this accelerates harder than anything I've ever been on. And so all I did for about an hour was just wide open up and down the straightaway. <laughs> and uh, it was just the coolest thing. And uh, we'll have it for a little while. It's a 14.4 kilowatt hour battery pack. Uh, it does about 150, 200 miles on a charge, depending on how you're driving it, and looks really cool. Love it. Did, did you time a zero to 60 on it? I haven't yet, but I have all my GPS stuff ready to go. It's been pouring rain. We actually rode it up uh, and back to the track to home in the pouring rain yesterday. Nice. Uh, if you go on my Twitter, you'll see all the posts of it ripping down the straightaway and riding in the rain. It's a cool bike, but um, definitely got a little wet. Right. I drove the, like the, um, the, the older model, the, uh, S, uh, zero, zero motorcycles S, or I think they had a, a performance variant of that. And, uh, yeah, when I, I wrote about it, I think it was, it was a few years back, but it was like the hand of God grabbing onto the front wheel when, and just pulling you and it would crack that throttle and you, you know, you're waiting for it. It was just, it's just otherworldly, you know, without, without no sound and, it's like yeah it's incredible. yeah and it's it's unbelievably stable because there's wheelie control so even if you lean back in sport mode and crack it it doesn't let the front wheel come up when that's on it's okay. got full abs i mean i did you know as hard as i could break and it's 
and it stops everything from locking. It's really cool. Uh, and it's got rain mode. You can even customize different driving modes with a zero app on your phone and you can adjust how much regen you want off throttle, how much you want it to add when you hit the brakes, uh, how much power you want, your top speed. You get all these sliders. And so, uh, you know me, I set everything to max and just wrote it and it was great. Right on. All right. So let's get on to some news of the day. Well, this is news coming up of news. So it's finally almost here. And by it, I mean Tesla's battery day slash Tesla annual shareholder meeting day. It should start at about 4.30 Eastern time this coming Tuesday, the 22nd of September with the shareholders meeting. And then immediately following that, we'll get a presentation about the batteries, which will include, according to a tweet from Elon Musk, a tour of the cell production system. So what we what we expect to see is the fruits of the so-called Project Roadrunner. Um, this is thought to be Tesla's first shot at building its own battery cell and production line. Up, in this, up until this time, it's used cells produced by Panasonic for its cars, which is their partner at the Nevada Gigafactory. Uh, as an aside, it will be it will be interesting to see how this relationship changes with the expected uh, cell change. You know, will they stay partners with Panasonic, or will, will Panasonic's role change? Or you know, just be interesting to see how that evolves. Um, so basically, the goal of Project Roadrunner is to reduce battery costs and improve performance. So increased energy density and longer life. They, they want a million mile battery, uh, all while losing its controversial uh, cobalt content. So in the past few days, uh, images of a cell have leaked out that is supposedly the new Tesla cell. And it's very different from anything we've seen before. I think uh, the, the cell in the Tesla Model 3 and Model Y is a 2170, which refers to their, their size. I think it's 21 millimeters one way, maybe seven, 70 millimeters the other way or 700. I'm not exactly sure. But anyway, this new one is a lot bigger. If you see on the screen here, it's like a shape of a biscuit tin. Um, it's maybe like 54 millimeters across and maybe a hundred some millimeters tall. Um, yeah. And it's thought to be tabless and the tab might be thought of as the, like the tip of the cell. So this, this cell is flat across the top, like this tin you see on the screen. And it's believed to be designed by, uh, designed to be used in the cell to pack architecture for battery packs meaning meaning that the cells won't be in modules but you know they'll all be together in the pack in one big mass so that's one way to increase energy storage in, in a given volume and decrease weight and cost uh, there are different different opinions about the cooling of the pack whether it be whether whether it will feature plate cooling or immersion of dielectric fluid I, I lean towards the dielectric fluid and I believe that's the approach that Lucid is taking in its Formula E and passenger vehicle batteries. Um, it's not expected that we'll see a cell with totally game-changing energy density, though we may learn about a decent amount of improvement. I think from today's like 260 or so watt hours per kilogram to maybe 300 watt hours per kilogram. We should, though, get a roadmap to a very incredible increase. Uh, Elon recently said on Twitter that a 400 watt hour per kilogram cell should be in volume production in three or four years. And that's enough, they were saying, to possibly, you know, uh, uh, begin with uh, electric airplanes. So that'd be great. So, and aside from batteries, the jury's out on what else we'll see. Uh, we might see a new or revamped vehicle. Uh, Elon did tweet that many exciting things will be unveiled on battery day. So I'm hopeful. Uh, the so-called Plaid Model S could be introduced. So I, I, personally, I'm hoping for a replacement for those models, the Model S and Model X. Uh, so Tom, uh, how, how do those predi battery predictions sound and what sort of exciting things do you expect to uh, be unveiled on battery day? So I think you did a really good job summarizing it. I'm trying to come up with what I could bring to this conversation. Usually you'll say a few words and then hand it off to one of us. But honestly, Dom, super job there. Um, it's speculation. We don't know what to expect, but I think you really touched on everything that we're kind of hoping to see. The one thing that I will add, you mentioned the battery size, which I think many um, uh, Tesla owners know, but everybody in the audience might not know. When the Model S and Model X came out, they it used this, the, uh, they called them 18650, but it was basically 18 uh, millimeters wide, 65 millimeters high. 
uh, when they the battery sells. Uh, when they introduced the Model 3 and now the Model Y, they used the 2170s, which were 21 millimeters wide and 70 millimeters tall. This is a Tesla Model 3 uh, 2170 cell, which is 21 millimeters wide, 70 millimeters tall. This came out of a crashed Model 3. So the new biscuit, if that's what they're going to use, again, that's all speculation. Um, it looks like it's it's not much taller than this. Um, in, in some of the pictures we've seen on, on some social media sites, but it's much wider. So it was speculation, it might be 4070 instead of the 2170, or as you said, it could even be 100 millimeters tall. That Then that would be much taller than this. But just to put things into perspective size-wise, you know, this is, this is probably you know, um, 33% bigger than like a, a, a AA battery. Uh, you know, I wish I had, I should have gotten one and put it in the sides. And the, 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 the biscuit type looked like it was at least twice as wide as this. So this is going to be a much fatter cell if indeed that's what they're using. And you also mentioned that it, the rumors are that it will be tabless on the top. Um, adding that tab on the top, which it's, it's kind of hard for you to see here because this one was broken off. You might see a little tab there where the connection is made. That adds a lot of cost on the manufacturing. And, and if they can create this cell where it's tabless, um, that would save uh, quite a I think the estimates were like 15 percent um, just on, 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 on having to add and have that tab on the battery. So that's a huge savings uh, for Tesla, which, as we know, you know, they're all about just drilling down the cost of batteries and, and doing everything they can to get them more energy dense and, and, and cost less, uh, more so than, than, you know, any other uh, electric vehicle manufacturer who pretty much, for the most part, leave it up to their supplier to do that and just say, give us the best you have. Tesla, you know, just that that's not how they work. They're pushing the envelope to make the best that's available today. Right. So yeah, that, uh, that taking away the, the tab too, I think it'll allow, I think they want the whole top of the cell actually to come in contact with the, the, the current collectors. Yep. So it'll, um, it won't be like a, like a hot spot. you know, all the current will have to flow through this like tiny space so much. It'll, I think it'll be distributed over a, a, a wider space. So that should help with the cooling. So we'll see, uh, should see, you know, better charging, better acceleration, Kyle. Yeah, uh, to that point, the wire bonds, those little mm. tabs that go to the current collectors, basically, um, what those do are, um, or I should say, there's a big problem with those in, in P90D especially, but also P100D Ludicrous, where they run so much current through them when you do launch mode in Ludicrous Plus that they actually begin to disintegrate. And there's a current counter at wide open throttle in all of those cars that when you reach a certain number of amps for a certain number of seconds, a little message comes up on the screen that says please bring it in we'll give you a new battery pack because you've ruined those wire bonds then what tesla does of course is they put them in 90d or 100ds that are not performances that won't need to you know work those wire bonds hard the packs are fine it's just those little connections so uh, that's something they've been doing for a while a lot of cars in germany run into that um you know ripping down the auto bonds basically but this should eliminate that problem and allow for higher power output for plaid vehicles Right on. Martin, do you have any uh, expectations for battery day? Yeah, I think there's going to be two sort of two um, strands to this. I think there's going to be the cheaper chemistry that will be going into the standard range plus vehicles. So I think that that's the less sexy bit because the LFP batteries, the lithium ion phosphate uh, chemistry, which has been used in commercial vehicles forever, really very stable, cobalt free. Uh, they come in, you know, normally prismatic. Uh, form factor, which, uh, so, uh, you know, just anyone's watching this just very quickly, we've talked about the cylindrical cells, there's also pouch cells, which lithium-ion batteries can be made in, like big baggies, uh, and then uh, and then there's prismatics as well, which can be anything, really, they can be uh, like a lunchbox or a briefcase or any, they're hard plastic sides, any, any kind of uh, shape, really, but, you know, you can have maybe... Uh, 10 or 15 or 20 of those and just put them into a uh, a battery and that's cell to pack technology because the cells are really big much much bigger uh, very stable chemistry not as energy dense uh, you need more more cells to get the same range but i think the key is tesla's been working on their efficiency 
so much over the last couple of years. But the, they're, they're like, like real 1% gains. So they've been working on uh, everything they possibly can just to eke out a little more. But when you add all that up, actually, you get to the point with the standard range cars and the, and the SR Pluses, not just in China where they're doing this, but I think around the world, they'll use this cheaper chemistry that again they can they can say hey it's cobalt free and there's no controversy over that and and it's just you know not as sexy to talk about but it is really really important in lowering the cost of those those vehicles i think that's that's one thing that's, that that's the about. lfp uh, lfp sales from yeah, uh yeah, getting yeah. from cattle a catl i think those are going to actually yeah. be sold in uh, australia i heard too yeah, so there'll be uh, that's the rumor to export from Elon said a couple of years ago, but you know things change so quickly right. that, that, that it's not like he was misspeaking at the time that made in China means sold in China. But the rumors now is that actually they could export from China to that Asia region, right. which is yeah, which is sensible. Um, right. And actually, some some talk about right hand drive models um, again for those right hand drive markets okay. of which the UK is one, and, right. and there's obviously some pretty robust supply chains going from. China to everywhere, really, because they make everything there. So, you know, that could be one thing. Um, and that could be our way that we get the Model Y quicker than Berlin being finished. But then the other side, I think you're right, what we've just talked about is that kind of, hey, we've worked out how to make cells ourselves. And here we go. And then I think there's going to be, uh, there's also going to be an increased focus on broadening the partnerships. So because for so long, well, uh, because Tesla was so early, and because they needed a partner with Panasonic, they went hand in hand. And I think it freaks people out a little bit to realize that Tesla might be just sampling the wares of other people. So, of course, they've, they've got deals with CATL and LG Chem. And so I just think it'll be a, a broad range of suppliers. So, But it, it seems weird for, for Tesla fans who have followed that journey for so long. And it was just Panasonic. And we've seen Panasonic increasing investment in uh, Nevada and just turning a profit. And although maybe a year or so ago, the relationship seemed a little bit perhaps right. uh, not as tight, not not wobbly, but just not as tight. I think recent comments from both sides have shown that uh, the partnership is strong there. So I think we'll see a few things, actually, and, and they'll be talking about the different partners they're working with. Plus, of course, the headline is going to be, hey, we're doing it ourselves. Um, so we'll... Uh, we'll see. I'm surprised they're still using that cylindrical uh, form factor. It has got advantages in terms of cooling, like a greater surface area and things like that. But also, as I say, there are certain advantages to having bigger cells because you can have fewer of those in a in a cell to pack, not needing to make modules and then put modules into packs. But maybe these cells are big enough that you can do that Do that with. Uh, they know what they're doing. Uh, so I was surprised at seeing, when that, when that news broke this week, I was surprised at seeing how small they still were. I thought the, the cells were going to be bigger. But right. uh, I'm yeah, look, look, looking forward to it. It's going to be lots of, lots of... I'm not sure we're going to see any car news. I no? don't know if that's... No, I'm not so sure. I think maybe <laughs> there'll be the sort of... And finally, moment with maybe a you know, sort of Model S plaid or drive out or something, or uh, or you know they'll show it off. But in terms but, of a redesign, what are you kind of were you thinking like a an an interior that matched the three and the Y, a kind of a total redesign? Uh, I would like to see uh, something more. I like to see them move away from what they did in, in the three and the Y interior wise, and, and go for a more luxury feel in their upscale, you know, Model S or Model X or the Model S or Model X replacement. But they did say like many exciting things. So I'm I'm hoping it's not just like I mean the battery is kind of exciting for me, but I mean maybe not for everybody. But I think so for most watchers, I I, I expect to see a I think many exciting things means like a product or something something you can drive. Yeah. You think I would agree with that because 99% uh, of people don't geek out like we do over the technical, how to build a car, right. how it's all put together. I think exciting things is Roadster that can do vertical takeoff. That's pretty exciting. So we'll see some, hopefully right. something like that. But you know, I don't know that lucid air though. I don't know if they're going to be able to top those specs. Yeah. That's going to be interesting if they launch right. a new top car. The specs on it though. But I just think that the, uh, of course the specs always get the headlines, but the thing about the lucid air is just how luxury they've gone. Right. And they've definitely gone for those buyers that would have been aiming to buy, you know, a, 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 an S class or, or but a really expensive Mercedes or a German car or a Bentley, and actually persuading them over to a. So 
there was nothing in the lucid thing that we talked about last week or the presentation that that made me think someone sitting down to buy a Model S is now thinking, oh, I'll buy a Lucid, because it's twice the price. So, uh, they, But it was the luxury. They just that, that word they kept using, quality and luxury. So I don't know. I don't know if, if Tesla are, are all of a sudden going to pivot to, to being like, you know, hey, look at our massaging seats and all those kind of things. I'm just not right. sure that's where they are. I think they're, they're, right. they've just got that, that, that sort of that 60 to 100 grand place in the market for the S and the, and, and, and the X. Um, and if anything, they could make them a little more premium. But because all of a sudden you're thinking, well, actually, I'll just get a nicely specced Y and it, and it's the latest technology and it'll do do a job. So maybe right. they do need to go a little a little a little further up in terms of of luxury. Um, but certainly an interior redesign should be on the cards at some point. Uh, it's just when do they do that? So. Uh, right. It would make sense so, to yeah, have oh, one, well, one screen and one set of internals, you know, in supply but chain. But like a, a year ago or so, they, I think they were saying that the the Plaid model Model S would be happening about about this time. So I expect to either see like whatever the Plaid Model S is going to be, or a replacement. I, I really want to see a replacement. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see what they have. It's ne like next Tuesday, so at four thirty. Tune in. It's going to be fun, and uh, yeah. So I guess let's move along real quick. Let's see, yeah. Uh, so the saga of Nikola versus the Hindenburg uh, research group uh, continues. Uh, I wanted to touch on this controversy with Nikola Motors for a moment. Uh, last week we noted that the outfit called Hindenburg Research had published a damning report about Nikola Motors called Nikola, how to parlay an ocean of lies into a partnership with the largest auto OEM in America which is quite a title. Uh, the OEM partnership here is the one we talked about with General Motors uh, in which they've agreed to build the Nikola Badger pickup truck using General Motors' own Ultium batteries and powertrain. And it, General Motors actually just this week uh, have decided to name their the powertrain and the motors and, and things uh, with the same Altium branding. Anyway, but uh, so Trevor Milton, who is the founder, chairman of the board, and public face of the company, said he'd respond to the allegations from uh, Nikola point by point. And so it, it took a few days, but it, a response finally came. However, it only addressed through like 10 of the like 53 uh, issues that Hindenburg raised. And though Nikola had said it would ask the Securities and Exchange Commission enforcement to investigate it, it seems like Nikola is actually the one now being scrutinized by the SEC. Uh, so meanwhile, uh, Hindenburg published a second piece after Nikola responded and titled, We View Nikola's Response as a Tacit Admission of Securities Fraud. So no beating around the bush there. Uh, in that piece, they say Nikola debunked nothing. Instead, it either confirmed or sidestepped virtually everything we know about, and in some cases, raised new un un unanswered questions. So the effect on the company's stock price has been kind of interesting. When Nikola and GM first announced their partnership, the share price had shot up to like $50 or so. Uh, and then when these allegations came out, it tumbled back down to the low 30s, where it's been relatively stable the past few days. So that indicates to me that the street isn't like the investors aren't too worried at this point they're not you know panicking for the exits but it's all pretty uh, it's all a pretty big mess uh martin i imagine you've been trying to keep up with all of this do you think uh nickel will recover or do these incidents uh, where it appears as though they haven't it hasn't been entirely truthful with investors in the past mean that its future is in jeopardy uh, you know it's that it, there's that wordplay that annoys me because uh so the the report there was loads of points, but like one of right. the biggest ones that got that got all the attention was yeah. that the truck they unveiled, yeah. the semi truck, uh, right. the first they one. released a, a, a promotional video of it driving, um, and they claimed that it was rolling downhill. And when I read that, I just thought, well, I hope you've got really good lawyers because if you're going to say that, Nicola are just going to sue you. And then the rebuttal came, and the point was, well, the gearbox worked and the steering worked. And there's some other bits work, but just not all together. And right. anyway, we never said it was driving. We use the phrase in motion. Now, they haven't deleted that promotional video. They've left it up. And I went back and checked. And yeah, they used the phrase, here it is in motion. And so, yeah, <laughs> here is a, what is called a, a pusher. Uh, here is a vehicle which they made to roll downhill. 
<laughs> like, oh my goodness. Uh, did it harm did it harm them? Well, I mean, you know, when they issued that rebuttal, the stock price flew like 13% up. I don't understand it. And I don't understand this story because there is hydrogen technology out there. And you can look at the the Nexo, there's Calif there's cars in California, there's filling yeah. stations out there. Look, it's not for me. I don't want to use hydrogen to get around personally. I don't want to replace like for like. I don't want to replace the filling station model we've got at the moment where a small group of big companies dictate the price of which I fill up my car. And we get rid of that, a once in a, in a, a lifetime opportunity to get rid of that where we are subservient to to the the price that a handful of people in the world dictate to us that we fill up at and Preach. then we move we move to an opportunity to fill up our cars on wind and solar and renewables and i don't want to move to hydrogen for that reason just because right. there'll be a handful of companies that control the hydrogen price and and it's it's fabulously complicated to make and also to transport and to store in your vehicle. And, and and they're just EVs anyway, just with a very small battery. So that's why I don't want to. So yeah, my it, it's amazing how they've said for years, we have the best technology in the world. We have the best batteries, the best hydrogen fuel cells. And then they say, oh, actually, yeah, we rolled it down a hill and made a video. So that was just one of many, many examples. Uh, and it's proof, if you like, that they didn't do the things that I was led to believe, or my impression was they were much further along than they were at the time. They've since said, oh, we've now got all that technology. We just don't want to use it because we're going to pay GM for theirs. So it's an interesting story. I've right. kind of stopped paying. Since all of that, I, I've made a bit of a mental note to stop paying any attention to Nikola, and I've got a little you know, date in my diary that when they release something that is for sale, I'll pay attention again. But for me, I'm going to draw a line underneath it. Uh, it's uh, f for, for for that to be admitted and for the stock price to go up 13%, that's not based on any kind of reality. That's based right. on people wanting to make money, trading, speculation, and I've got no interest in that. So good right. luck to Nikola, whatever they're doing with GM, good luck to all of them. And, uh, you know, wake wake me up when they got something interesting. Right. Well, I, I feel like it, this, you know, this word play, you know, word play with this claim kind of, it's just cast out on like, they've made a lot of incredible claims. Like they be like, they say they'll be able to bring the price of hydrogen. Cause that's one of the other, besides the whole, you know, control by a few of the hydrogen supply and, you know, um, uh, just the reduction in prices that they they've announced, or that they said they would be able to reach, like were you know, were just kind of incredible. Uh, like I think it's from like eleven dollars a kilogram to down to like three or four dollars a kilogram or something. Just you know, to make it practically on par with with electric costs, which I don't see how that's even possible. But you know, I already had doubts in my mind, and and just just creates more doubts. I don't know, Kyle. Do you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm I'm very much with everything Martin said. I think it's it, a lot of this is just talk back and forth, back and forth. We have no products. We have nothing that we can drive or do. You know me. I, I'm not really a great company analyst. I like to analyze cars, things that that are on wheels. So not probably my my area to to weigh in here personally. Though it all just sounds too fishy to be anything here. I don't know what's going on. So you're but, not investing. Uh, you're not buying stock. But, no, not at all. No, not at all. No. I think, um, yeah, I, I, there's, they don't have anything. Do they have right. anything that's I, interesting? No. I don't, I don't, <laughs> so, you know, they, they build, you know, all the, all the IP and the GM deal looks to be like GM's IP and intellectual property, you know? So, well, the GM uh, deal's interesting because, uh, as far as I understand it, there's very little risk to GM, right. uh, through this whole thing. I mean, basically they will get paid to produce the Nicola's if they're able to, and then they won't, if they don't make them. So there's really right. not much. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a supply deal for their technology, so they're gonna yeah. they've got to make this technology anyway. Yeah, um, they're gonna make the Ultium. Right, they have, they're gonna have anyway. the production. Yeah, so it's a customer, and it just could be that that customer doesn't come through. And of course, they've uh, in return for whatever they called it, a transfer of knowledge or services. They've also got a big two billion chunk of of, of nickel. They're not actually given them two billion. They've just 
been uh, awarded that share. So there's right. really no downside for GM. Yeah. Apart, I don't from, see why everyone's concerned about GM doing all this. I think just, it's in, just in, the in, PR in, side, but. Yeah. yeah, but if 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 anything goes uh, south, then perhaps it's a dent to people's reputations for right. for doing the deal. I uh, I said on the uh, on the, my podcast this week, um, there's a there's a uh, phrase uh, that uh, uh, that I meant one of my family members used once, which was "all mouth no trousers," uh, which was uh, which made me smile. Uh, and then somebody emailed me to go, "Hey, we have a phrase uh, which is big hat no cattle." Um, mm. And then people started chiming in with all that, and so basically it became a theme this week of uh, of, uh, of phrases that people use to describe people or companies that that talk a good game but can't back anything up but you know what when and and and, and the antithesis of this is peter rawlinson which fits m and like his not it's not a british thing i'm just saying it's the way that that lucid are doing business just sits much better with me personally which even at their reveal he said several times we got nothing until a right. customer drives one and and he, and that was their big day and he was not pouring cold water on it but humble uh, and just real and just saying, look, as hard as we're working, no one's got one yet. So judge us when we hand them over. And I just, you know, I, it, it's, it's so refreshing to hear that. Hey, hey Tom, you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, well, the, you know, to be honest with you, the video that they produced doesn't, bo doesn't bother me that much because I, I've seen other manufacturers do similar things like that, that, that nobody ever found out about, like in advertising. So, you know, that, that happens, that kind of stuff happens all the time. Right. And they were careful with how they crafted the words, you know, and they didn't say, you know, driving under its own power or whatever. So that didn't bother me as much as all the, uh, everything else. And, you know, I, I was, I've been skeptical of, of, of the company for a while now, but when this deal came out with GM that, that set showed, that was just like the final straw for me. And I'm kind of like Martin where I'm just sitting back now and saying, you know, good luck guys, but I can't put any stock into this until we, we see something tangible. I mean, the fact that they've been touting how they have this, you know, the world's greatest fuel cell technology, and they've got these batteries that are going to, you know, they're, 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 you know, 400 watt hour per kilogram or whatever the number was back then. I don't remember the exact number, might even been more. Um, and now we right. find out, oh, yeah, but when we go into production, we're going to get all that stuff from GM. Like, you know, <laughs> what's going on here? So uh, I'm looking forward to kind of, I will pay attention to the SEC investigation. Maybe it's going to reveal that, you know, Hindenburg, uh, you know, overstated some things and, and or that Nikola did. Um, either way, I'm glad that they're both being looked at. And um, if anything, if anything comes up that there was actually some wrongdoing, uh, the people should get fined and fined harshly. You know, Hindenburg, uh, you know, they're known shorters, so they could have. Yeah overstated the problems that that Nikola is having or uh, fabricated stuff. We don't know that yet. And if they did, I hope they get punished, you know, harshly. But if if it comes out that um, everything that they posted was correct and that, you know, Nikola is this house of cards, then, you know, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't see how the, the company can continue if 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 the SEC um, really reveal some damning information, but let's see. Let's see how this pans out. I, I don't want to say too much. I don't want. I don't want to be part of the lawsuit. <laughs> so, um, right. Uh, you know, it'll be interesting to watch, though. Right on. All right. Well, let's move on to a company that's actually making stuff, uh, electric stuff. Uh, so, after a long period of silence, Ford is talking about its electric F one fifty again on Thursday. The automaker held an event where it revealed it would build the pickup at its Rouge, Rouge Center in Michigan. It's investing $700 million into that plant, where they'll also be doing some battery assembly and adding about 300 jobs. And that part of, part of the complex will be called the Rouge Electric Vehicle Center. Uh, so we also learned that the truck will be the most powerful F-150 yet. We've already seen it pull the train, so, you know, that's a bit of a stunt, but still... Uh, so yeah, we've seen it pull the train. Uh, so it will have also have the fastest acceleration, and uh, and this is kind of a neat, a neat thing that they underlined. It will have the lowest lifetime total cost of operation among F series trucks. I think they were saying as low as forty percent less over the lifetime of the truck for you know total cost of operation. So uh, they will have over the updates. 
a giant frunk, a front trunk, uh, two motors, so I guess all-wheel drive, uh, power outlets, so you can plug in your power tools or whatever. They did a lot of, um, they put a lot of emphasis on uh, it being a work vehicle, you know, four trucks build America kind of kind of thing. Yeah, and they flash, if you're looking at YouTube right now, they flash this little picture uh, on the screen just briefly at one point. So I don't know if this is the, going to be the actual face of the new all electric Ford F-150, but it's, it's kind of odd. It's got a weird light bar signature kind of, yeah, you have to take a look. Um, so that's, uh, oh yes, it'll all, yeah, over the updates, did we say that? Yes, okay. So right, it'll be a work, a work-oriented vehicle, as opposed, they said, to a lifestyle vehicle, which was a bit of a poke at everybody else, the, the Rivians and the Cybertrucks and everything, uh, the GMC Hummer EV. Um, so that's all good. And we also learned that it will, it will begin production in mid-2022. So if you're keeping score, that's like a year after the Rivian R1T comes out and at least six months after the Tesla Cybertruck and the GMC Hummer EV pickup truck. And, and who knows, maybe even the Chevrolet electric pickup truck. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit Johnny come lately. Kyle, is, this, is Ford giving this competition too much of a head start? No, I, I think Ford's taking the right approach and I believe Ford's been taking the right approach almost all along. I think uh, what we're this is where things get serious. Uh, as they mentioned correctly mentioned that Rivian, uh, you know, of course they com- commented on lifestyle vehicles. All of those are lifestyle vehicles with the exception of maybe the Lordstown. Uh, the mm-hmm. thing where I see this getting really serious is when a big OEM comes out like Ford, where they already have all of the fleet contracts already in place across you know thousands and thousands of trucks a day that they sell. Now you can add the electric into this mix. So, you know, there's going to be so many fleet operators that have used Ford since 1972 and they're going to depend on it. And now it's electric. This is going to be their move into the market. So I don't expect to see this capturing a new audience to pick up trucks. Like I see every model three owner wanting to drive a cyber truck. I don't think every Ford focus owner is going to want to drive an F-150 electric. I think it's going to be the next step for many existing F-150 customers, not only for daily use, but also for delivery, driving, power line work, whatever kind of work they do. Uh, Ford's going to build it tough. We saw a video where it was just smashing around, going up these steep inclines, pulling stuff. They're doing it right. And again, they have the contracts already. They're, they, it's okay if they're late. They don't need to be first. They just need to be t- uh, tough, strong, and have a really good cost of ownership over the vehicle. It sounds like they're doing it just right. It- which is what they highlighted. They were saying 40% less over right. the cost, and that is huge in, if you add up the diesel that you would have put in uh, or the, the, the gas you'd have put in a, a truck versus the electricity. And the other thing that they went um, really big on uh, was saying it's going to be the most powerful F-150 ever made. So it gets bragging right. rights, instant bragging rights. So what's not to love I mean, about they, it? They showed it pulling a, a trailer, like a, I'm not sure if it was a double axle trailer, but you know, like a horse trailer size thing. Up, it looks like a 60% grade, like, just like it'd be, it'd be tricky just walking up that hill, man. <laughs> it's, it's nuts. Uh. There's definitely a pattern here. If you notice, um, when companies introduce an electric version of an existing car, they have, let's say, the Toyota RAV4, the plug in hybrid, it's the most powerful RAV4 ever made. Yeah. Like we've seen this time and time again, and, and, and that bodes well for the future of electrification, especially in the truck area, um, because everybody wants power. Uh, you know, even if they don't need that much, it's like this big power struggle. Um, but um, what I, what Martin mentioned, and uh, Kyle probably touched on it too, that I think is enormous here. Now, Kyle's 100% right about that not being concerned about being late because they're going to appeal to a totally different customer. This this could quite possibly be the first real electric work truck. Fleets aren't buying 50 Rivians to do construction work no. or line work or you know something like that. that that's not the, the, the segment. But, the, but they will buy the F-150s. And if they can deliver at you know, close to the 40% total cost of ownership savings. Think about bean cover. The bean counters are going to be like flipping out over this. Every five trucks they buy, they get two free. 
over well, the lifetime of the vehicle. That's insane. Right. Some of these companies own hundreds of trucks. And right. just think about what that does to their bottom line. So, you know, uh, th- this is going to be enormous if, if Ford can deliver on something like a 30 to 40 percent total cost of ownership um, over the vehicle. You're going to see companies transition to electric vehicles. So uh, these electric trucks so quickly, Ford won't be able to make them fast enough. And, you know, the, the, yeah. the companies will go way quicker than individuals, um, you know, but they they'll see them on work sites that they're working good and then they'll want to buy them, too. But I'm yeah. I'm telling you, if they can deliver on that type of total cost of ownership, I mean, I, I know I have friends that own companies that have fleets of, of vans and big delivery trucks. They fight for pennies, they, 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 you know, because it adds up and, you know, 5% savings would, would they, they would switch out their whole fleet for. So, you know, you're talking about 30 to 40%. That's insane. Um, yeah. One of the other things I'd like to point out is um, they also mentioned that they'll have an enormous front trunk or front, right. um, which Rivian also has. I mean, the Rivian's trunk is, eno- is huge. I, I, you know, the, Two of us could fit in in that and close the, the 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 hood. The only problem is that I saw it has such a high um, rim. You know, you have to get whatever you're picking up over the front grill and into it. Right. Then it goes down deep. If it's heavy, you know, you know, you won't be able to pick it out. I wonder if Ford could make the front grill like on hinges, like the back of a pickup truck, where the whole front snaps down and you could slide stuff in and out. That would be awesome for a work truck. Right. I was thinking the Bollinger pickup truck has a, a front lift gate. So that whole front, you know, it folds down so you can, you know, put stuff in your front more easily. And that would be kind of neat if Ford could do something like that. Yeah. yeah. And, wh- and what I like about it as well is they've gone for a very, very conventional style. Um, yeah. Because whilst at this stage of the adoption curve, um, I'm quite happy to, you know, an EV that looks different or is styled differently. Cybertruck's a bit much for me. Uh, but uh, but what I'm, you know, you think about is the next mainstream wave of EV buyers. And they just want a conventional looking car. And especially truck buyers as well. As Kyle says, if they've owned this truck for the last 30 years and, yeah. and, and they're changing the powertrain and all of a sudden it looks different as well it could be a step too far and so that conventional look as much as it might not make a lot of sense in terms of drag and getting the most efficient ev possible in a couple of years time battery technology bigger batteries all right it's not doesn't make sense in some ways but actually i like the conventional it's just going to look like an f-150 like if you just saw it from a distance it would look the same and i like I really like that at the moment. And that's why I like the Rivian, because it's it's a little bit different, but it's very conventional looking. There's a big chunk of people who want to blend in. They don't want to be driving around shouting, I drive an electric truck. Not yet. Not yet. Anyway. Um, and of course, in a couple of years time, the electric charging network is going to be oh, night and day different to what it is now as well. So a lot of those concerns that companies might have now, which is, oh, look, if I buy 200 of these trucks, can all my employees charge them when they need to? Look, in two years' time. The frustrating thing is it's two years away. Right. The good thing is, in two years' time, the charging network will be vastly improved. It's true. So the thing I was thinking about with this late uh, start date is that uh, you know another company can come in and just grab that mind share. So when you think of electric pickup truck, you think you know Chevrolet or Hummer or you think Cybertruck. You know, someone could grab that mind share sort of thing. But with Ford, you know, they're you know, their F-150 is like the best selling pickup truck for decades. So I, I think they don't really have a lot to worry about there. They, what I was thinking though, if they, if their sales are all fleet sales, uh, I know with traditional vehicles, fleet sales are great. It help you boost your volume, but you make like no money on them. You know, it's not, it's not a profit center. It's, you know, they make the money selling, you know, it helps them make uh, better margins on a vehicle because it, you know, increases the, uh, just the scale of production, but yeah, there's there's not a, mon- a lot of money to be made. So that's just another piece of the puzzle to think about. Uh, so yeah, let's move along. Well, speaking of pickup trucks, we learned the other day that uh, uh, the much teased crab mode coming for the GMC Hummer EV. Well, as as we suggested last week, this mode is for going sideways. Well, not quite sideways, more like diagonally. 
Uh, and that's because it will have four wheel steering. So I personally love the idea of a uh, four wheel steering on a truck and can't wait to try this out. Tom, are you ready to cancel your cyber truck res- reservation now? <laughs> Well, I need a truck. You know, I always have a truck here in the driveway with my plow. I've mentioned that before because I plow some properties. And I just can't wait to get one that's all electric. And now this new Ford has got me excited. So we'll see. You know, um, uh, you know, this sounds interesting, too. Like, I I just wish they were available now so I could choose. Um, But uh, I did. I did months ago when we first talked about the 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 uh, electric hummer and cram mode um i said that i think it's going to be four wheel steering and i know a couple people in the comment section were like ah no way it's going to be like rivian uh you know it's it's going to do tank turns that's what they're talking about and they they kind of uh really uh shot me down so uh if you're out there listening i was right (laughs) that doesn't happen often but i was right in this in this case and i didn't have any kind of inside knowledge honestly i i i haven't uh talked to gm about this or whatever but yeah, yeah it looks cool um and uh this is i just love this stuff it's innovation like you know yeah. th- that's what electric and we've mentioned this before electrification is bringing you know tank turns and crab modes and you know all kind of new stuff and it's breathing life into automobiles and not just these little incremental upgrades and oh we'll add bluetooth and now the vehicle can do this and it's got 20 more horsepower we're seeing like these real you know global changes in the vehicles and that's really what excites me about electrification not just that it's powered by electricity you know we're getting things that just you know we wouldn't have gotten if 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 we weren't um you know doing this electrification transition so that's what's really cool about it and uh, i can't wait to see the humber i'm excited about i'm definitely excited about it so kyle you, you've driven the cars with four wheel steering before Oh yeah, plenty of times. Right on. I used to drive back to my boss. I had an old boss back in the end of the '80s who had a, a Prelude with four wheel steering. That Preludes had them. So did the 300 ZXs back then. I loved loved yeah, it but so that was much. To, that was to help things like turning circles and at sure. Speed right. It was passive the wheels, rear wheel steering. That, it was parking too because they would turn one way depending on, on the speed, but they would turn the other way if like oh maybe at slower speeds. Cool. So oh, you okay. could park it really easy, but then going around. Yeah, it was really cool. What kind of dynamic changes do you think this will bring to a, a large well, rear wheel? Truck? Rear wheel steering gives you a few benefits, and GM's no stranger to this. They've had it. They had I forget the name of it, but some silly GM name uh, like they called you know auto headlights, twilight sentinel. I've been saying that on the last episode <laughs> too. So you know it's probably like magical rear wheel unicorn steering or something like this. But Qua- basically, um, is it qu- quadra steer? Quadra steer. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> terrible name. Terrible name. <laughs> Uh, so these things are like if you ever find a Silverado or Suburban that has quadra steer, buy it because they're actually worth a lot of money. People mm-hmm. will hold on to them just for that because their their turning circles are incredibly tight. Now right. the benefit with the Hummer is there's going to be no driveline connection that it's going to have to push through, so you're able to get much more uh, steering on either axle. So that's where we're going to see this crab mode come into play um but but you get two things you get a tighter turning circle you also get uh while you're on the highway the rear wheels will turn in the same direction as the front wheels to elongate the wheelbase and make the car much more stable but when you're doing dynamic driving it will slightly turn the opposite direction and therefore it shortens the overall wheelbase of the car synthetically and it makes the car much more agile to turn and then Typically, this is found on like Porsche GT3s and stuff. When you drift, it locks the rear wheel straight so it goes sideways better. But that's, you know, we probably won't see that in the Hummer. Uh, would be pretty cool if you could drift it, though. We might see that. I mean, this thing's got a thousand horsepower, zero to sixty yeah, three seconds crazy. or something like crazy This thing is going to be a beast of a, a performance vehicle. Like it's a super truck, like the, yeah. Basically, well, there's only it, one way to find out if it drifts. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see as soon as we get one. We All know right. just the person. <laughs> yeah. When, when is that coming out? Is that this is like next fall, right? 2021 fall, 2021. Still, man, everything's always a little bit of ways away, even though, yeah, things are starting to arrive now, new vehicles everywhere. Man, it's just, there's always like this really neat stuff that's still on its way. Actually, look at the front of that picture if you look on your screen is the uh, gmc hummer ev frame it almost looks like it could accommodate a, a, fr- a front uh front uh t- tail front gate tailgate 
You see it has like a big opening yeah, into does. the front? It looks like that that's how they're engineering it yeah. to, 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 to have easy access. Yeah, that would be nice. That's something to keep your eyes on, I guess. So actually, if you look at the top of the hood, it, has, it looks like the, uh, the grill part is like attached to the bottom of the front of the hood. Yeah, that would make sense for the crash structure in that that is all one the it's solid piece and that it's just the hood that has the mm -hmm. the bit that, that that comes down it's look that's going to be very very useful for so many people yeah um as long as it's as long as it's watertight and uh, you know you can store stuff in there it's going to be safe um it saves you having to pull a a lockable color a cover over the rear as well so this could be the the area that you've got that's fully enclosed, fully watertight, very safe, nice and locked, expensive tools. And then you can leave the back open and just throw, you know, throw your sort of materials and, and, and the cheaper stuff in the back and not have to cover it over. That's going to be very attractive to a lot of people. Sure. So, yeah. right, right on. So uh, let's move along. We just, we got a bunch of more stories we want to hit on real quick. Um, so Electrify America has begun a pay by kilowatt hour pricing in select states, which they say lowers costs. Tom, I believe you may have written about this. Does it really lower costs? I, I've seen the conflicting reports from drivers and things. Okay, I need a whole podcast just to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, starting at 51 minute mark or 52 minute mark really sucks, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. So yeah, um, you know, this was announced earlier in the year that Electron America said that they were going to transition to a kilowatt uh, based pricing scheme as opposed to the time-based scheme that they've been using since they started. Now, that was brought on by the fact that California announced that they were passing legislation mandating that all uh, electric vehicle charging networks charge for the actual energy that is delivered to the vehicle, not how much time that the car is tethered to the station. So this was going to be forced upon Electrify America in any event, um, but it was going to happen phased in over the next 10 years. It was it was different depending if it was an existing station or newly installed station, or if it was a level two station or DC fast charge station. It all it was getting phased in in different time. But Electrify America said, you know what, that's the direction this is moving in. So um, after really thinking about this and spending some time, we're going to we're, we're going to we're going to convert the whole network to uh, uh, pay by energy rather than time. So this is the first phase. The 23 states now, plus the District of Columbia, uh, are the, they're the blue states on the map up there. Um, they are now uh, effectively uh, effective this week. Uh, charging by the kilowatt hour. There's two pricing structures, whether you're, if you're an Electrify America Pass Plus member, it's a flat 31 cents per kilowatt hour. If you aren't, uh, if you don't sign up for the subscription, which costs $4 per month, by the way, then you're paying 43 cents per kilowatt hour. If you use Electrify America at all, if you use it even once a month, it's cheaper for you to pay the $4 a month and be a, a Pass Plus member, then pay the extra, you know, 12 cents per kilowatt hour, because I think it's 33 kilowatt hours is the break even point. If you take 33 kilowatt hours per month of energy from the network, it, it, it's, it, it makes sense for you to just pay the $4 monthly fee and be a Pass Plus member. Now, in the white states on the map there, they haven't been converted yet. A few of those states, it is legal for... Um, uh, elect for networks to charge by the kilowatt hour, but Electrify America hasn't transitioned them yet. In most of those states, though, it's actually illegal for any entity to charge for energy rather other than a utility. And that's really why Electrify America started their time-based system from the beginning. They wanted a consistent uh, pricing structure throughout the whole country. And since like half the country didn't allow anybody but a utility to charge for electricity, they had to charge by time. They didn't want to have it broken up like it is now where half the country they charge one way and the other half the country they charge the other way. Uh, but the goal is eventually for the whole country to look blue like that. For uh, state by state, as they are allowed to, as they negotiate, they're going to um, uh, switch those states to kilowatt hour based pricing. Now there's four or five states in there right now that Electrify America could 
um, could have switched to kilowatt hour base pricing, and they didn't. I don't have right. the exact reason why, but they promise they are going to transition those states over also. Um, so that's that, that's it. Now, is it cheaper, you asked? Yes and no. Um, I just put a post up today where I reviewed two of my recent charging session station, uh, uh, sessions when I had uh, lo loaner cars. One was with a Chevy Bolt, one was with a Kona. And the Chevy Bolt charging session I had, I would have paid a little over $3 more under this new plan than what I paid under the old plan. With the Kona, it was different. I would have paid a dollar less now than what I would have paid before. There's no clear, easy way to say it's less expensive or it's more expensive. It depends on how long you charge for, what the state of charge of the car is when you plugged in. Did you fully charge it to 100%? Did you unplug it 80%? Um, but what it, this does do is it makes it fair. If you charge your car, if you charge your Nissan Leaf, and get 50 kilowatt hours of energy, and there's a guy next to you in a Porsche Taycan, and he takes in 50 kilowatt hours of energy, you're both paid the same. That wasn't the case before, and you didn't even pay the same depending on when you charged. Like in the winter, for instance, uh, you know, Kyle talked earlier about cold soaking a leaf battery, and, uh, and all batteries typically charge slower when they're colder. In, in Kyle's instance, that he didn't see that, but that's unusual. I think that's why he brought it up because t typically you wouldn't expect that when the battery was, was colder than normal um, to get a full charge rate. So in the winter, you would pay more to charge your car than you did in the summer because it took longer to get the same amount of energy. That won't be the case under kilowatt hour base pricing. One more thing I need to add is, in those states that are haven't transitioned, that are still time-based, Electrify America changed their time-based pricing structure. They used to have three tiers. Now they have only two tiers, right. up to 90 kilowatt hour and over 90 kilowatt hour. And that's what the vehicle can accept. And they dramatically lowered the pricing for those two tiers. So the states right now that actually are still stuck on time-based uh, charging billing, are gonna pay much less than what they paid before. The, the, the highest rate before was like 99 cents per minute, and yeah. now it's all the way down to like, I think 36 cents per minute or 34 cents per minute. So it's, it's in some instances, it'll be, um, I mean, per kilowatt hour, it'll be dramatically less what the customer will pay. And they simplified the charging. There used to be 12 different um, prices depending on which plan you had and what which of the three tiers your vehicle was in, depending on how much energy it could take in. And now with the time-based uh, billing, there's only four different prices. The two uh, levels of charging and whether you're a Pass Plus member or just a Pass member. So they've dramatically simplified the charging. Right, that's good, that's what we need. Uh, streamline use, usage and uh yeah, uh, and streamline pricing, like just, yeah. Yeah, make but the it, one thing it. I want to, sorry to interrupt you, Dom. The one thing no. I want to point out is, and this, and, and I think it was portrayed um, by a lot of people, and me also, and my initial um, post m might have, um, it might have seemed a little misleading. I, I kind of Im implied that the, there'd be a lot of savings here. Um, uh, at and at first blush, I thought that there would. But once I crunched the numbers, I looked at it. And this this isn't about saving money. It, it's about being more fair and everybody yeah. pays the same, the same amount. Many people will pay more under this new pricing structure. Some people will pay less. Right. I, I think, uh, yeah, I saw the prices around like 31 cents or so per kilowatt hour, which is kind of high. So we have to wait for, you know, competition to kind of bring that down. Um, yeah. yeah I, you know, that's, we need to do a whole podcast and talk about yeah. pricing and charging. Right. Personally, I don't think that's high. Um, I, I, I stated some of my reasons in the post that went up today on Inside EVs. Mm -hmm. That's my second post. Um, but uh, in any event, I know some people view that as very high because it costs a lot more than what you pay at home. Right. But hey, you're going to pay a lot more than what you pay at home when you use public charging infrastructure that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to install. And there's no chance that it's even poss possible for the operator to be breaking even today with utilization rates so low and demand right. charges so high. But like I said, right. maybe we'll pick that up some other podcast. 
Yeah, we'd like to. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about talk about with that because uh, with demand charges, they can avoid some of those. With uh, we, we've uh, noticed that they just installed batteries uh, at 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 least sixty of their stations from mm-hmm. from Tesla actually, um, and that's to help you know deal with um, demand costs. So when all of a sudden uh, a company asks for like a huge amount of a, a surge of electricity, they have to pay extra for that electricity because you know this is like a demand charge basically because they're. Do they have anything on Electrify America to stop people staying past eighty no. percent? No. As in, um, so over here we have things like overstay um, fees, or I, you know, the one I, the network I use the most has a ninety-minute okay. limit, um, which is fine. But you know, if you are then thinking, oh, I'll, I'll get to a hundred percent because you don't know, you've never been told, right. uh, then you'd get like a fifteen-pound fine or something on your account, and and. Uh, um, there's big notices everywhere, but that's the only the only upside to time-based charging, and there's only one, and that is to persuade tight people. Mm-hmm. Um, Agreed. It raises awareness of, of how long you're charging, and and for those that are a little bit tighter, they're like, oh, um, I can probably get to my destination. I'll leave now, rather than, well, hey, I'll just sit on here and eat my cheeseburger and let it top up and 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 at the moment we're short of fast chargers. That will change in the future, right. but for now. That's the only upside of, of time-based. Charging. There's one more upside, Martin. Um, in that same light, it also hopefully inspires the manufacturers to make the cars charge faster. If the customers yeah, yeah. are complaining that yes. that that they're paying more to charge than than a, a comparable car from another company, and that's one of the things that Electrify America talked to that we talked about. A year or two ago, when we when they first started, and I I was really drilling down on them with their with the pricing structure and saying it's not fair and kind of why didn't you go with kilowatt hour based pricing and that was one of the reasons they gave. They said, look, the OEMs are watching this. They're they're, they're watching. They're seeing what what the infrastructure is, what levels of charging are coming out. They wouldn't have built cars if we didn't build this network that mm. could um accept that could deliver 150 to 350 kilowatts. You know that 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 you didn't see the cars before there were uh, there were stations available so they said look look this is what we're doing to drive innovation we're putting mm. these chargers out there and no cars can even accept this power yet but we're doing it because if we do it they'll accept the the the, the manufacturers will make the cars that can accept the power and also by making them pay by the time we are nudging them to make their cars charge faster so their customers have a better charging experience and uh, like the car more so you know if there's no penalty for a slow charging ev then the manufacturers aren't going to make their cars charge faster that's Mm. what electrify america told me and there's truth to that right on all right this uh, actually we're at at time pretty much so let's just hit a couple things real quick uh before we and it, so uh, just this morning, Volkswagen confirmed it's working on an ID1, which I guess is a very small version, um, probably on their MEB platform, and also a Tesla Roadster rivaling EV. So Tesla, I mean, Volkswagen has the IDR, which is like uh, not a production vehicle. It's a race car that's like broken records in Pikes Peak and everywhere it pretty much runs, it breaks records because it's it's, it's a monster monster race car so uh we could see uh some of that technology trickling is down trickling its way down into our hands hopefully my hands <laughs> because that sounds like a lot of fun uh and they've also started last week they started the deliveries of the id3 uh the first edition and that's resulted in uh, so they've been building these cars for a while and they had the software issues so now they're just they're shipping these things out and in numbers big enough so that you know Norway's yeah. mid-month sales results has the ID3 ahead of Model 3 and ahead of Polestar 2, and it, it's cleaning up. And I expect we'll see that for a while as uh, the initial Russian orders get filled. Um, so what else? Oh yes, Proterra. That's a uh, Proterra in my mind is like the class leader in the city bus segment uh, in its American company. Uh, it just produced its. It's just introduced its fifth generation electric transit vehicle, the Proterra ZX5 or ZX5. I forget what you say here in the States. Um, so that's equipped with the highest battery capacity up to 660 kilowatt hours. Uh, or 
and, and range among electric transit buses. So with that big pack on there, it'll go 329 miles on a charge, which is, I don't know, seems like a lot for a city bus, more than it would ever need. Um, it has a couple other battery options, 440 kilowatt hours or 220 kilowatt hours, which sound kind of more reasonable. Uh, it also has du dual motor options, so that would give it 550 horsepower, uh, making a 35 or 40 foot uh, version of the bus go from zero to 60 and under six or zero to 60, zero to 20 <laughs> in, in under six seconds. Uh, so yeah, it's not a sports car, but it's, uh, you know, it can go up a 25% grade. So that's impressive. So I, I just wanted to mention that because it, per terror to me is like kind of cool. And I, I just liked what they do. Well, you're right. I, I have actually sampled the Proterra and the BYD offerings oh, yeah? have you driven? and by far pro uh, oh. not driven, just okay. ridden uh, and spoken mm. with the drivers and Proterra by far is a more premium yeah. bus. Uh, also with less inherent rattles, build quality was nicer and the electric motors were snappier. We even did a little tire chirp in a Proterra. So that is the bus to get. If you're interested in getting your passengers from a to B very right. quickly. Right. I think they use a rigid, they started to, I imagine they still do this. They have like, like a composite body to help save weight and they have the batteries down low and they have like a, the reliability is quite, well, uh, quite good compared to with some of their competitors. I, believe, I, I understand. And we have them here in Tallahassee. I, I spoke to a, a bus driver here who, who drives them and, and he, he was all about it. He loved it. So that's, that's pretty cool. So speaking of cool, Vander Hall, that's a, a niche uh, company in California. They make uh, pretty cool three wheelers and they have an electric version called the Edison. I got to see it in person once and I haven't driven it yet, but it's, you know, it's, it's sweet. Anyway, they released an amusing video uh, announcing a new product called the Navarro. Uh, this machine has four wheels and at least a partially enclosed uh, passenger cabin. We can't tell if the, that the roof is closed or not, but uh, yeah, and it's an off-roader. So it's a completely different direction. Kyle, is this a, is this a road going off roader? Do you think, or is this like a, just a fancy side by side power sports kind of vehicle? Real well, I, I think a uh, nice thing, certain areas you can drive those fancy side by side off roaders on the street. Um, right. I think I hope you can at least uh, register it as an NEV neighborhood electric vehicle or something like this, because I've never been a fan of the Vander Hall. I always thought it was the worst really? version of a Morgan three wheeler because it's not a true <laughs> Morgan. Uh, you know, it's not a true three wheeler, and it was front wheel drive and it just wasn't cool. This is cool. Uh, this will get me excited about the uh, the Vander Hall brand. And right. uh, yeah, I can't wait to sample one. Yeah, I can't tell if that's like a full size vehicle or if it's like a side by side kind of smallish golf cart. I think size. it's the answer is yes to both. It's probably about the same footprint as my smart car. Okay, that's kind of small, but with big off road wheels, those are big chunky tires on that. Uh, so real real quick, um, the Land Rover Defender has a plug in uh, hybrid version now with twenty. 27 miles of all electric range, which is pretty decent. And if you've seen the electric around the, the new Land Rover Defender, you know, it's a, it's a swank looking vehicle. It's, I, I like it. I can't help but like it. Yeah. And now, now I can like it for real because it, it can plug in and yeah, that's great. Uh, so speaking of, uh, uh, electric crossovers. The BMW iX3 is now, it's for sale in the UK, I believe, or at least it has pricing uh, been released. Yeah. So this is a built- <laughs> And it's really, and it's really, really oh, yeah? expensive as so this well. So is, this is built in China, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, so built in China, a little bit longer than the X3, but otherwise, uh, basically it's the same car. Um, built in China, uh, good specs, good battery, good range. Good speed, nice and luxurious, but still 62,000. So you are well up there in EQC territory, e-tron territory. So it, you've, you've, when you get to that price, you've just got to have something to stand out. And it's probably just brand association of of their buyers. The last five cars have been X3s or X5s. And they're like, okay, they're going in to do the lease or the finance deal. Like, what have you got? Oh, electric, I'll try one. And it's, you know, it, they're not going to pull anybody over from anywhere else with with this because you are paying a premium but right. eh, 
yeah, nice car, but still, like, it starts at sixty-two, but it, which is uh, equivalent eighty thousand uh, dollars. Yeah, it's like eighty thousand dollars, but that's on the road, so that's all your yeah, taxes and all. all yeah, the we have we have a twenty percent VAT right here, and that's and that's the man. starting price. You know, and BMW, uh, not strangers to an options list. Yeah. Right. You don't get windshield wipers on a base <laughs> one, basically. You gotta, gotta option that up. Let, right. let me check the picture because I, I I think you're only half joking. Uh. <laughs> no, look there. Well, that probably hides under the hood. All BMWs do that. But yeah. So more, more. Mark, just, do you know what the co- go ahead the cost of a base X3 is the gasoline version oh, in the yeah, UK? Yeah, it's actually pretty cheap because you can you can get into yes. the X3 quite. I want to say like forty five. <laughs> You can get Ooh. into the X3 pretty cheap. Yeah, so that's like a. Th- this is one of those instances where the electric version isn't even close. Yeah. Like even you know with subsidies, it's it's so much more that it's yeah. It's, it's going to be interesting to see if this can do anything. Maybe it will help people say, oh, why, why just get the Jag, man, the I Pace, or the or the EQ uh, EQC or something, or the Etron with you know just better performance. I think. So uh, before we end, just one last little thing, because I, I love this car. Uh, so Sandy Monroe of Monroe & Associates, who's known for tearing down cars and then helping other companies, like uh, it just got, it's just had a partnership with Arkimoto where they take, take the Arkimoto vehicle and figure out how to manufacture it uh, and more cheaply and come up with a better product overall, so better quality and uh, cheaper to manufacture. That's kind of what their specialty is. Uh, so now they're entered this similar kind of, uh, partnership with an outfit called Nobe Cars. Uh, and they have a video you can, you can uh, yeah, it's a picture of it there. And I love this thing. <laughs> it's a three-wheeler, which is, uh, you know, kind of funky for most people. And it's, you know, it's really hard to make three-wheelers look good. But I think they've, it, it, it's pretty, it's pretty decent, man. The white wall tires got the little front uh, grill, kind of reminiscent of Alfa Romeo. Uh, and like, but it still has this like 50s feel to it. And the company is from Estonia, which is a, you know a small uh, former country, former part of the Soviet Union, a satellite country. Um, and but anyway, yes. Yeah, so if you if you plug in uh, Monroe M U N R R O in the uh, inside of these, uh search field, you can pull that up real quick and take a, watch this video. I mean, it's Sandy's very excited about it too. And yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing more about this. Anyway, uh, that's our, that's pretty much all the time we have. That's our show for the day. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. And if you have uh, any comments about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post, the YouTube comments section below, or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. And don't forget, you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Uh, Tom is at Tomalog, Martin is at EV News Daily, Kyle is at Out of Spec, and I'm Dominic underscore Y. Click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications, and we'll see you all next week. Ciao.